Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Northshire Presents virtual event. My name is David Wood. I'm the events manager at Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person, the events manager at Northshire's Saratoga Springs location. Um, before we get started, I before I hand things over to her and we get started, she introduces our authors. Just a few things. Uh, as you came in, you probably noticed that we are recording tonight's event, uh, but only those of us who are unmuted and in this uh, little yellow highlighted box will be appearing on YouTube for, for perpetuity. Um, so uh, don't worry, but if you, when you have a question for our authors at any point tonight, please type it in the chat and we will save them up for you and pose them at the end during the Q&A. And finally, uh, a note of thanks and a plea. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a hard couple of years for independent bookstores for, for all, 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 all local businesses. Uh, and we wouldn't be out, we, we wouldn't still be here without you. So we really appreciate your continued support. Uh, and finally, it's been a really crazy year in terms of the uh, industry, in terms of supply chains. And so while our bookshelves are full, um, we are hearing a lot of uh, delays, publication dates, and when a book goes out of stock, apparently they're not going to have time to reprint it. So we're suggesting if there's a book you like, uh, that you know you want to order it now, order it sooner than later. Um, all right, uh, that's enough for me. And uh, Rachel, take things away. I am so very excited to get to be the one to introduce Kate Sweeney this evening. She's here to celebrate the publication of her debut novel, Catch the Light. She currently lives in the Bay Area, where she spends her time making music with her band, Magic Magic Roses, teaching literacy, and working with her husband at the family art framing business. Um, and she is a local girl. She spent much of her childhood right near here in Cambridge, New York. She's going to be interviewed tonight by Prince Award-winning novelist Nina LaCour, whose many wonderful novels for teens include We Are Okay, Watch Over Me, Hold Still, and Everything Leads to You. Her most recent book is You Know Me Well, which she co-wrote with David Levithan. Please join me in welcoming them to Northshire. Hi, thank you so much for having us. And I am just so delighted, Kate, to be able to um, help you launch this gorgeous, gorgeous book. I have been, you know, sometimes struggling to read a little bit these days with everything that's going on and the just overlap between home and work and all of that. But um, Catch the Light, it's just so, such a beautiful book and I enjoyed every moment of it. And it's, um, you know, heartbreaking and heartwarming and heart filling and just so full of life and beautiful settings and characters. So I have so many questions um, for you, Kate, and I guess we'll just jump in if that's all right. Yeah, it's great. Okay, okay, good. So um, I wanted to start with the beginning, which seems like a natural place to start, and also just to acknowledge how difficult it can be to know exactly at what point in a story we should begin. Um, and yours just feels so perfect, your opening. And so I was wondering if you would read us um, the opening about a page and then tell us a little bit about the book itself and, and maybe how you came to that specific beginning. Sure, um, okay. We drive into Cumberland, New York late on a Wednesday afternoon and oh my God, it's beautiful. It's the time of day when the light is just starting to turn gold and we're driving through thick forest and the sun is dappling down through the leaves everywhere. There are layers and layers of shifting light, hundreds of shades of green, magic. It's almost enough to make me forget why we're here. It's almost enough to make me forget my grandparents in the front seat and the tedious, awkward 10 day road trip and the hours of NPR and the slow driving and the musty motel rooms and the subtle humiliation of my grandmother herding us together at every single state park and viewing station, wielding her ancient iPad like a Leica M10 and chirping, smile like you mean it. It's almost enough to make me forget, almost. My sister B is sitting on the other side of the back seat with her earbuds in, staring out the window. She looks lost in thought and the leafy sunlight is moving across her pale freckled face in little flickers and flashes. She's 14, old enough to be pissed about the whole thing, but young enough that it's not ruining her entire life. To be clear, this whole thing is ruining my life. Not that it really matters. The grand scheme of things is much bigger than that. I get it. 
But in California, I had friends. I had a boyfriend, sort of. I had a job at the photography store downtown. I had parties hanging under the giant palm tree on the lawn after school, laying out in the hot sand at the beach on the weekends, a whole senior year shimmering off in the distance. Some days it was still hard to do anything, grief pressing down like a weighted blanket, but things were getting better. And then six weeks ago, a month before my older sister Hannah left for her freshman year of college in Connecticut, I overheard mom on the phone. I'm drowning, Elle. I don't think I can do this. Your, your prose throughout the novel is, is so gorgeous. And I could tell from that first opening section just how special of a book I was um, beginning to read. So tell us, tell, give us a little background about the book, share whatever you'd like to about it. Yeah, so um, a lot of the sort of circumstances of the novel are based on my own life and family history, although the characters are quite different. Um, but I did move from uh, South Pasadena, a suburb of LA to rural upstate New York when I was 11. And I do just really remember that like cinematic moment of driving into the town where I was going to be living with my sister and my grandparents and just being amazed at how beautiful it was. And even though everything in my life was just an upheaval, but this place, just the trees, the green, the summer of upstate New York was so undeniable. Um, and so I think when I started writing the novel, I just like started that part has never really changed um, in any of the drafts. So yeah. That's so lucky. I feel like sometimes that happens and sometimes you have to really feel around and try so many different things out. Mm -hmm. Um so, I mean, I guess speaking about that move that Mary, the, the narrator makes, um, and especially hearing that you moved when you were 11, I'm curious to know, you know, how you chose to make her a senior in high school, like senior year is such a difficult time um, for her to make this move and to settle into this new place, especially she's leaving her best friend and her sort of boyfriend um, back at home. And she has these plans to return to California for college. Um, but she's thrust into this new life in this town of Cumberland, so whether she wants to be or not. And it's just such a compelling moment to set a novel in. Um, like a time that's always a time of transition, but then also just made more pronounced by this huge cross-country move. And you have this wonderful line that Mary says describing it. She says, sometimes now I feel like I'm, I'm in between, stuck somewhere between what my life used to be and whatever comes next. When I'm here, I can't get to anybody and nobody can get to me. So I wonder if you always knew that you'd set the novel during Mary's senior year this way and how you made that decision. Uh, I actually, the first few drafts of the novel were not set in Mary's senior year. Um, they were set in her junior year. And then when I was like in the long process of querying agents, um, one of the agents who I ultimately signed with, um, Melanie, she suggested to me well, she, I had to do like a revise and resubmit, which is where they're like, we really like this, but we want you to make these changes and we'll make them and then resubmit them. And then we'll decide if we want to sign you. Um, so she gave me some feedback that was like, this needs more tension, more something like a ticking time bomb. And that was one of her suggestions. And I actually was really anxious about that at first because um, just as a person, I have a lot of very complicated thoughts about um, college and the private college system and, and having read all of these novels that are set in senior year for, for young adults that everyone's just like marching off to their like chosen, you know, private college. And I felt so anxious to kind of like enter into that conversation in that moment and decide where I would situate myself. Um, so yeah, I think it did end up bringing a lot more attention to the book and it was so interesting to think about also and added that extra layer. Yeah, oh, that's so interesting to hear. And I I really like hear what you're saying too. I used to teach high school and I, I taught some high school seniors and 
just being able to watch them and see who was really feeling ready and motivated and like that's what they wanted that that traditional college path was exactly right for them versus the ones who were doing it because it was expected of them and really like either weren't ready or it's just not what they're meant to do in their lives they're meant to have different paths um was a really just like poignant thing to witness up close that way and so i i won't give anything away about your book but i really love the way that you that you handle it thank you um another thing that i was just incredibly drawn to in your book is you have this wonderful cast of characters like every character feels really real and I especially found myself so drawn to the women of Mary's family um she has her sisters Hannah and B and her mother and her aunt L specifically and will you tell us a little bit about this um beautiful family that you made for Mary they're all so wonderful and there's conflict and strife and so much love and affection and just like um, vibrancy to them. So please tell us about these characters. Yeah, well, um, I definitely grew up in a family of strong women. Um, and my grandmother, actually, her name is Mary Sullivan, which is, I, I named my character Mary Gold Sullivan, and then abbreviated to Mary. And then one day I was just like writing it. I was like, oh, Mary, so I didn't even realize that I had made that her name. But um, anyway, she was kind of this very strong matriarch and also a fascinating person and um and on my mom's side during the pandemic we started um a book club with all of my aunts and my female cousins and we um and I grew up with a brother who I love so much but also two sisters who are closer to me in age so I think that female relationships are just such a big part of my life and who I am and um I wanted to write about that and explore that and share that um, with people. Yeah. Did you, I always, I mean, I know I'm really putting you on the spot here because I can see that you have a lot of family members, <laughs> but did you find it difficult at all to write about like sisters having sisters and was it, was there anything you had to navigate around um, your portrayal of Hannah and B? I mean, in a way, like I felt sensitive. I didn't want anyone to think that I was like making them one character because I think in a way we are all, all of the characters. Although um, Aunt L is definitely my Aunt Betsy who I know is here, but is like very much based on her. She's such a magical uh, human. Um, but yeah, I didn't want anyone to feel like pigeonholed or like I had mistold their story. And it's, you always worry about that. Yeah. 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 Well, I would have been happy to see myself in any one of those women. So I <laughs> think you did a beautiful job. Um, so I wanted to talk about the the loss of the father in this book. And you open your novel with a beautiful dedication to your own father, who you say was also a writer. And in your bio, you mentioned that you start right you started writing when you were 16, which was five years after he died. Um, so much about this book is about a girl who's mourning the loss of her father and how his death has impacted the whole family. And um, it made me think a lot about myself and my own work and how some of, to me, like one of the most magical things about writing is being able to take like those losses and that pain from real life and mold it into something and like craft something beautiful out of it in a way that is often very difficult to do in real life with with those feelings and so um i would love for you to read a passage on page 28 which is one of my favorite moments in the novel um mary and b are at aunt l's house and sharing this quiet moment of missing their father together and then i'll ask you a question after that um i tug my backpack out from under the bed and pull out a stack of prints a long strand of Hannah's hair floating across the sky, the cushion of Bennett's palm peppered with tiny pieces of gravel, a triangle of light on the peeling paint of Nora's windowsill. On my phone under the ocean, there are other pictures, slanting afternoon sun on the beach pictures, sweaty dancing, smiling pictures, me and Nora laughing, me and Bennett almost kissing, B flipping off the camera, Hannah laughing until she peed her pants. I try to swallow the fact that those are gone. 
Instead of crying, I tack my photographs to the wall until I'm surrounded by lopped off parts of what used to be. Bee's got her door open across the hall, so after a while I get up and head in there. She's lying on her bed with her earbuds in and her eyes closed. I lie down next to her. She doesn't seem startled by me, even though the music is blaring so loud I can hear it. Talking heads, dad's favorite. She pulls one earbud out and hands it to me, and I stick it in my ear and we lie like that for a long time. Here's a secret about my dad. I'm starting to forget. I don't remember his smell or the feeling of his skin, and my memories curve around the empty spaces where he would have stood or spoken. Sometimes, right before I fall asleep, I try to bring him into my mind. I think of a time when I know he was there. I draw his outline from photographs. Behind my eyes, I try to color it in. But the more I try to remember him, the more he's gone. Lying here on B's bed, I know he's in us somewhere, in the space where, mu where the music seeps into our ears, in the iconic drums at the beginning of And She Was, in the place where our hair is mixing together on the bed, in our cells, our genes, but I can't get to him. I grab B's hand and I pull it into mine. Her palm is soft and warm. I squeeze as hard as I can and she squeezes back like she knows all of my thoughts, like she's thinking them too. Such a tender moment of connection between them. Um, so tell us what it was like for you to write a story about a girl whose father died, where I assume both of the characters resemble your, you and your dad, but aren't exactly you and your dad. And tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. Um, it, it, just being able to revisit this pivotal moment in the life of my family and um, to see it now I'm an adult and I'm a parent and I'm an artist and I'm a writer. And so being able to see what happened through everyone's eyes or try to think about what was that like for my mom? What was it like for my dad? What was it like for my sisters? Um, and to really get to write the story in, from all these different perspectives, even though it's just the one main character. Um, it felt really amazing to be able to do that. And um, yeah, and just to explore some of those ideas that I've been thinking about for so long. Yeah, yeah, it really felt, you know, I mean, as you said, it's told from Marigold's perspective, but I did see how everybody was mourning him so differently. Like even the grandparents who only show up in the beginning of the book, like I, they, their grief is manifesting so differently than Marigold's mothers and Marigold's sisters. And she all have different ways that they're coping with, with it. And I also found like something that fascinates me about grief is how it feels so um, alienating and isolating. And yet it's also so incredibly universal. It's something everybody goes through. And, and, um, even like among people, even among family members who have lost somebody, it's both an incredibly isolating experience and a communal one at the same time. Mm -hmm. You really yeah. capture that very beautifully in the, in the book. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, a little on the lighter side, <laughs> I noticed I really loved the use of texting in the novel and it felt so relevant. I mean, I think during the pandemic, I've been texting more than ever because I'm trying to keep in touch with people and it's often hard to make time for phone calls. Um, and I noticed because there's so much physical distance in, in this book between Marigold and her people back in California who she's left, there's a lot of this kind of like yearning feeling over text and like that the insufficiency of that sort of way of communicating. Um, and so I, I chose another short passage for you. It's a, a really little one, but um, it just stood out to me so much. So she's um, Marigold's texting her sort of boyfriend, Bennett here. Um, and so go ahead and, and read it for us and then I'll ask you. 
Just as I'm closing my eyes, my phone lights up with a text from Bennett. School tomorrow is going to be weird without you. I write back, so unbelievably weird, all of it. In the darkness, I wait for him to reply, but he doesn't. I read our texts again and again. I wish I knew how to say something that means something. I wonder if it's really possible that in just 340 days, I'll be back in California, if he'll be there too. I can almost see it, the three of us sitting on the beach in Santa Barbara like none of this ever happened. But every time the edges start to come into focus, a piece of the middle disappears. I, I, that passage makes me think so much about the breakdowns in communication in the book and also in life. Um, but there's just, there's so much love among all of these characters and so much history and, you know, between them, but they often don't know how to express their love for each other and, or they get so wrapped up in what they're going through that they don't see what the people in their life really need from them. Um, will you tell us a bit about how all of that worked for you? Yeah, uh, just first on the texting, which is really funny that when I first started to write this, I made a scenario where like Mary Gold's mom just wouldn't let her have a cell phone. <laughs> and then I sent it to my friend, Kate, who was, who was the first person to read it. And she was just like, no, mm -mm. <laughs> I was like, ah, cause I, I felt so, I don't know, texting. I was like, I'm not ready, but, um, anyway, then it ended up being such a big part of the book. Yeah, it really did. I mean, I would say it really enhances it. It's cool. Sometimes other things we resist become the elements that really add texture and like a lot of interest. So. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah. So when it comes to all of the miscommunications and the, I, I had real moments of this book with my editor where I was like, is she like, likable like is are people going to not like her because she makes a lot of everyone in the book makes a lot of bad decisions and and hurts each other um and uh a lot of times when I read a book where a character is just making a lot of bad decisions I can't even finish the book I have a hard time mm -hmm. um, and I think that for me that's because I am a huge perfectionist. And if I think about my time when everything was happening in my family, my reaction was to just like hold it in and, and make all the right decisions. Um, and so I think it was like, I, it was like, I wish that my younger self could have made bad decisions, could have made mistakes and messed up. Um, because I think that that is a healthy part of the grieving process. And I think that grief is really messy. And so, um, that's something that I wanted to portray. And I don't know if I wanted to, it's just, that's, it just kept coming out. I was like, Oh, she's lying again. Like, <laughs> but, um, it felt real and like a healthy experience of grief, whatever. I mean, there's so many different healthy experiences, but. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I, I think what made her remain someone who we root for and keep reading is because like, it's so understandable why she makes the choices that she makes. And one of your lines that I love so much is that she says that she feels like she's in a spider web of her own making and she really is. And I like, we follow her through that web and the weaving of it. And then, um, you know, of course, uh, without giving anything away, like she will find herself part way out of that web. And that's really important. And that's such a gratifying journey to be on as a reader to, to see someone get themselves in a whole lot of, you know, complicated situations and then, and then get themselves out. And so I think, I think it's great. Um, all right. So your novel examines the idea of home in many different ways and like what it is and what it means to leave it. We haven't talked about Jesse at all, but Jesse is this wonderful character who's Marigold's new love interest. And he's just like, you love him from the moment you meet him and keep loving him <laughs> forever. And um, at one point he talks about his town where he's always lived and he says, Cumberland is a weird place. I love it, but I can't wait to leave. And um, I would just like to hear about Cumberland and LA for you and um, 
what, what they mean and in, in terms of home. And then also like, what is home for you now? Because I could see in the novel that home is, is a very, an important theme um, for you. And so I'm curious to know more about home. And I will also um, let everybody, or just remind everybody that you're welcome to put questions in the chat for Kate too. I know probably you have lots of things that you'd like to hear from her, so, all right. Um, okay, so um, I, my family moved around a lot growing up and I lived my first six years in Athens, Georgia, and then I lived in Southern California from six to 12 and then, or 11, then when I was 11 turning 12 is when I moved to Cambridge, New York. Um, and then I lived in Salt Lake City and New York City and finally San Francisco. And um, I think I'm just a person, I have like a little bit of a wandering spirit. Like I love going to new places, but I also have this like very sentimental, like I miss the smell of the air, like, you know, that kind of very sentimental about places that I'm longing for that I'm not living in anymore. Um, and so I think for a long time, that was a real tension in me of this, like wanting to leave, wanting to stay. It was hard to figure out kind of how to find home for myself. Um, and I think that's definitely a struggle that's reflected in the book. Um, and yeah, now I live in the Bay Area of California. Um, it's been 11 years, so longer, almost twice, I guess 12 years now, sorry, just past the 12 years. So twice as long as anywhere else I've lived in my life. So I really feel like the Bay Area is home now, even though I still have like such a fondness for all of these other places that I've lived in my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you feel that way. Actually, I was going to say something, but I, I don't want to spoil it for readers. So <laughs> I will, I will stop myself there, but there's an element of, of your novel that makes me think about the nostalgia comment that you've made and, um, just the idea of pining for a place. Um, all right. So I, I also, another, I feel like I'm keeping like my favorite thing about this book, but there are just so many wonderful elements of the book to love. Um, and one of them is the way that you depict art and art making and how so many of the characters are artists in all sorts of different ways. Um, there are, you know, the photographers and the painters. And also I think about B and the way that she transforms herself. So like, she's like kind of her own palette. She like completely changes and transforms. And um, there are just so many different wonderful elements of art in the, in the book. And so I, I want you to read to us again. Um, so this is a scene between Marigold and Aunt Elle. And um, I just really loved how the depiction of art making in this scene and how it kind of like opens up room for the other things that are happening with the characters as well. Okay. Sorry, I, am I starting this from the beginning of the page break? Oh yeah, let's see, 102. I love, um, <laughs> I've just given Kate assignments here yeah, for what to read to us. So let me be more specific. Um, okay, I was thinking, yes, I think let's start from the beginning and then just read to the break. Okay. Um, Elle invites me on a walk in the woods after breakfast. Bring your camera, she says, I'll bring some pens. B, she calls up the stairs, pulling on her boots. Come walking with us. There's an entire deer skeleton just waiting to be added to your treasure collection. I don't do that anymore, B calls back. We push and cajole, but in the end, it's just the two of us walking side by side under the leaves. How are you feeling, Elle says. I'm fine, I say. You're always saying that. It's cloudy today and wet, and there's a pinkness to the air. The light is thick. It feels like dusk, even at 11 in the morning. Elle doesn't say anything for a long time. It seems like we are in some kind of gentle standoff. She's not going to ask me again, but she's also not going to say anything else until I give up the goods. Finally, when the house is far out of sight, I give in. I'm worried about mom and B, I say. Elle stops, wiping her brow with a green handkerchief. Me too. Then she turns to me and says, this is the hard part. What is? 
She leads us into a clearing, settles onto a stump, reaches into her bag for a sketchbook. The whole time I'm wondering what she could possibly mean, but then she finds a blank page, tapping it once with her index finger and says, when it looks like it should be over, but it's not. I stand next to her, fiddling with my lens cap. I wonder if that's what this feeling is, showing up in a new town where no one even knows it happened. New school, new locker, new friends. Underneath my backpack and my sundresses, I'm walking around with a hole in my side, but no one here can see it. Maybe it will be better now that every part of our life is gone. Maybe we won't know that dad is missing because we won't know where to look. Elle takes out a tin of watercolor pencils. She runs her fingers over each of them before selecting a color. She's not really looking at me at all. And it feels like some kind of therapist slash lion tamer trick to get me to keep talking. It works because eventually I do, aiming my camera at a spot in the distance, twisting the lens in and out. I keep thinking that if I can just get through this year, then I'll get my life back, I say. I bring the camera away from my face without taking a picture. I'm not sure it works like that, Elle says. Her expression is cloudy, thoughtful. I want to ask her, how does it work? But a drop of rain breaks through the treetops, falling onto the place where her hand is drawing a thick blue line, and suddenly it feels like our talk is over. Well, she says, folding up her glasses, I guess we should go back. She takes her finger and rubs the splotch of rain into the page, spreading the color around. Then she closes the notebook, wipes her finger on the front of her jeans, and leads me back through the trees. I find that section just so beautiful in so many ways. And I think of like the thick blue line and then the, the rubbing in the splotch of rain as just such a beautiful reflection, visual reflection of, you know, how they feel. And also this like gorgeous symbolism of like taking what's external and, and helping it or welcoming it into the work of art and into this thing that you're creating. And I just, I just really love that part. So tell us, um, you know, I, I know that, um, you're a writer and a musician, and I know that you're surrounded by art as part of the family framing business. Um, and so tell us more about just how art influences your, your life and how you experience the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my everyday life, I'm just surrounded by artists. A lot of my friends are artists. Um, and my sister is an artist and she's an art professor. Uh, and when I was in college, um, I did study photography. Um, and at, it was sort of at this time when the, the way that I had lost my memories of my father, I was really um, just doing so much reading about memory and thinking about it. And my sister also, um, she was in grad school in the same place. And so, um, and her work at the time also really a lot centered on memory and um, photography and our dad also. So um, we had so many great conversations about that interplay of photography and memory and um, how you photograph things to take, to capture a memory, but also looking at photographs degrades your memory. And um, it's sort of this tension that I've always been, we both have always been so interested in and I've been really inspired by her work. Um, and then also just, I think having different art, it's just more ways, more metaphors kind of to explore those ideas of um, loss and memory. Um, and I love, I loved all that. Yeah. Yeah, well, you wove it in so skillfully in, in the book. It's really just so lovely. Um, okay, I only have two more questions and I see lots of wonderful questions in the chat. So um, we'll get to audience questions very soon. I, I just wanted to ask you, so this is your debut novel and congratulations again on, on it. It's such a big deal when your first book enters the world and terrifying and exhilarating all at once. Um, so will you tell us about the path that you took to this point and, and how it feels to you to have it available and, and on shelves and in people's hands and houses? Yeah, um, my path to becoming a writer has been a little uh, all over the place kind of. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I started writing kind of in my teens in, in high school and really felt connected to that 
um, and my dad was a writer and um, when my sister and my brother-in-law got married, they got married when I was 18 or 17. Um, and I gave a toast at their wedding. And then after I gave the toast, um, so many people came up to me and said, wow, your, your voice, your writing voice sounds just like your dad. Oh. And so I, then I kind of, for a while, I became obsessed with this idea of writing as like a way to channel him and to connect with him in this sort of like almost spiritual way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of continued through college. And, um, I studied with, um, the writer, Mary Gordon in college. She was like such an amazing mentor to me. Um, and I left college being like, okay, I'm going to be a writer. Um, but one thing was that I wrote always very short stories in college. It was short, like poetic, very weird. Um, and I had this one professor, um, right before I graduated, like this visiting professor dude. Um, mm -hmm. And he was very much like, you have a great handle on language, but like, I don't know if you can write a story. Um, and that I think like really stuck with me. And then I was, you know, in those first months out of college, like trying to do it. And I was like, oh, that's right. That's true. I can't, I can't write a novel. I don't know how to write a novel. So um, I just kind of put that aside. And um, at the same time, I was really getting into making music. So I started playing music in New York and then I moved to San Francisco and I became a part of a band. And that was such a part of my life for a long time. Um, and then 10 years went by <laughs> of no writing prose. Wow. Um, and then I had my son, Angelo, and um, just got swept into the void of motherhood which was so intense um and one day when he was like one and a half I just realized that I was completely disappearing as a person and I didn't write anymore I didn't make music anymore and it really frightened me kind of um so um I actually did started the book the artist way mm -hmm. um and got into like doing the pages and a lot of that is like uncovering your buried dreams and I totally was like, oh, I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. That was my identity. That was who I was going to be. And then I just did it. Um, and so I just started writing. Yeah. And then I, um, I wrote this book during National Novel Writing Month, <laughs> which is just really um, an intense time. And so I had my like two and a half year old and I was working full time as a public school teacher. And um, so I was like waking up at five and like writing in my car, like all of those things that you hear mother writers, I was doing I was, like hiding in the bathroom um, to get it done. Yeah. Um, and then I did, yeah. And, you know, I had to do the querying for an agent, which was a year, a very hard year, oh. um, but then, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a, what a path to get there. It's just, it never ceases to astonish me how damaging, um, like feedback can be from people you respect. <laughs> like I had a professor who I respect very much as a person and a writer in, I, in grad school and on, in the margin of one of my, um, submissions for workshop, he wrote, this is just awful, <gasps> like on the, down the margin of a page. And of course, like there was praise in there too, on um, different, but I remember none of it. And for years and years, year, like, as like, every time I felt like I was wavering in my work, I would just see it. This is just awful. Like it would just like be in my head. It took me, I, I haven't, I, I think I'm actually over it. Like, I think I have gotten over it, but very recently. And um, yeah, just especially for those of us who are perfectionistic in the things that we do, that can be such a blow. So I'm so glad that you did the artist's way in those morning pages and that you found your voice again, like, and, um, kind of the permission to do what it is that you, that you really love to do after that. Yeah. It's been a weird journey, but I'm, I mean, I wouldn't take any of it back. I'm just feel so grateful for, yeah.
I'm glad. Fun. All right. So the last thing I have to ask of Kate tonight is um, I asked her to find the a passage that she loved, like maybe her favorite passage. And I'm very excited that she's going to read us. A, it, it will shock you all. She is going to read us the final paragraph um, <laughs> of the book. And but it's because there are no spoilers in it. So we get to just revel in the beauty of the end. And then those of you who haven't read it yet can read it knowing that it does not spoil the story in any way. Yeah, it's pretty vague, but I've, I'm reading this because um, in that, you know, the story is the hard part for me and, and the plot and the ending of this book was so hard. Um, and my editor, Kelsey Murphy, who is amazing, she just like really kept being like, the, let's do a little more with the ending. <laughs> and um, it was really hard for me. And then when I wrote this, I was like, oh, this is, this feels right. So when mom comes home, we are asleep in a heap on the couch. My head is on Hannah's stomach and B's feet are in my hair. I hear mom set down her keys and pull off her boots and tiptoe into the living room, stopping in the doorway, trying to be quiet. I keep my eyes closed, but I can tell she's watching us. She comes closer, her feet almost silent on the rug, and then I feel her lean down to press a kiss to the top of my head. For one second, my face is in the curve of her neck, right under her throat, the place where her heartbeat surfaces. I blink my eyes open then to the blur of her skin up close in the dark. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for reading that. Um, all right, that's it for my questions, audience question time. Thank you both so much. That's has been great. Um, there's a question here from John. First question uh, for you, Kate. He asks, when did you start writing this book and did you take notes at the time of the events? Um, well, so I started writing this book in National Novel Writing Month in 2018. Um, so, and actually because I just really don't like it and it was my first time and it was sort of a story that I knew. Um, I didn't even um, really outline it before I started. I just went in and then I got like halfway through and I was like, oh, I need an outline. Uh, so I kind of went back and forth, but it was very, there were not really notes. It was just sort of like word vomit <laughs> for a long time until I completed it, yeah. So the next question comes in from Shelby um, asking, it's a two-parter. Um, first of all, why did you choose to focus on YA as a genre? And then the pandemic has been so hard on adolescents. Has the decision to focus on YA transformed in the time since the beginning of writing and publication? Um, I think that, I mean, first of all, I'm a huge fan of YA. Um, I'm a huge fan of Nina's, like your, your books really um, are so close to my heart. Um, so this is such an honor on a side note. Um, but so that was part of it that I love YA. Um, and also I love teens um, and adolescents. I think it's such a just dynamic part of life. And I really identify so much with myself at that time. And also, and also this story feels like it belongs to that genre in a way like that's where the story took me um but yeah now I'm on my third I'm writing my third um YA novel right now I'm drafting I started it in Nina's slow novel lab class um and yeah there's just also I have my um my teenage niece Mia who's 18 just started living with us so I have like a teenager in the house now um and yeah, it's been really, I don't know. I just love it. And I don't know if the pandemic has changed that or not. I think I need to think about that one a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Pizia. She says, um, where do you draw inspiration for the vivid imagery in your writing? Um, I think that, I um, 
I mean, part of it is just, that's my favorite part of writing is sort of, I mean, I've been a songwriter for so long and I just love like capturing these images and I love words and um, that's the easy, easiest part for me. But I think it also comes from just what I was talking about earlier, that like extreme nostalgia that I have for all of these places that I've been, that I miss, that I'm not there anymore. Um, and I think that that's like where a lot of it comes from is just these like deep longings for places that I love. There's a great question here from John um, asking, did music play a role in your creative process? Um, I mean, in a way, like music has sustained me creatively, like in with that in between part when I was not writing. And so it is just so much a part of me. And also I think that music does play such a big part of this book. Um, partly because my dad loved music so much and music was such a big part of our family growing up. And it's just for me, like music and memory and family is just like all together. Um, and so, yeah. And even in my family now, yeah, we're all just like breaking into song all the time. It's just part of everything, yeah. Uh, Joanna asks, which character was your favorite to write? Um, my favorite character to write was definitely B. Um, she's just so real and honest and like doesn't care and um, is so interesting and quirky and totally someone who I wish that I was, even though I'm not, but like I just loved getting to create her and and I think that in a lot of ways, like her expression of grief is like the most authentic and she just says what's on her mind. And I just admire that so much about her. So the next question came to me anonymously in direct messages, okay. um, but it is, um, you said that the setting of the book is a fictionalized version of Cambridge. Did mm -hmm. you have to do research to match reality or did you let yourself make things up? Um, I mean, a lot of it was based on just my memories of growing up there, which was 20 years ago. So it's obviously has changed a lot, I'm sure. And I think that's why I fictionalized it because I am not still of that place anymore. And, and my memory of it is so connected with that time. Um, so yeah, I didn't really do, I don't think I did very much research. It was much more just, I took a lot of creative license and made it the place that matched like my nostalgic memory of, of the place. Uh, we've got a question here from Anne. I think we were just about out of time, but she, she says, um, did you find it hard to write about young adults today? It feels like so many things have changed since we were teenagers, like cell phones. Did you have to purposely think? I'm going to finish off for David since his technology seems to be acting up and it's a technology question, so it's appropriate. Um, <laughs> did you have to purposely think about how to use technology in the lives of these characters? Um, yes, that was definitely one of, as I mentioned before, just like one of the hardest parts for me. Um, again, I like if I had my choice of writing it, I mean, maybe I just need to write like historical fiction because I just don't want to write about it. Something about it is just like, it's not like beautiful to me, I think part of because it's not like my experience. Um, and it's definitely something that my editor and my agents have like really helped me of like, hey, like let's, would they really be doing this or would they be doing that? Um, and so it's something that definitely does not come naturally to me, but also like Nina was saying, there's something really cool in getting to explore these new ways of communicating. And um, there's a lot of opportunity there when you're, um, when you're, exploring something new, yeah. So I have one last wrap up question before we have to sadly say goodbye. I um, mean, this is actually for both of you. 
Um, I would love it if you would both share some of your writing influences, some of the writers who have helped make you who you are. Uh, you want to go first, Nina? <laughs> sure. Um, well, as a, it's funny, I actually, like on my desk right now, um, I have <laughs> Anne Sexton's um, self-portrait and letters, which was something that I got when I was in high school or maybe a freshman in college, read all of her letters. And I just pulled them out again because I'm working on something that um, spans a few decades, but includes like the fifties. And I was listening to her voice and just remembering how closely I read those poems and um, her letters and everything. And then um, Virginia Woolf is just like my, my go-to. Um, I, the way that she captures emotion and like just kind of these experiences, she just like is able to make them crystallize in this way that I always find just mind blowing. So when I need inspiration, I, I turn to her and reread some of her books. How about you, Kate? Um, yeah, so I think that what's coming to mind in terms of like the writer who made me want to be a writer, um, would be Toni Morrison. I just, um, her craft is just so perfect and the writing is so beautiful and just draws you into a world. Um, and yeah, when I was a teenager, I ate up every single one of those books. Um, and, um, and then in the YA world, definitely Nina and also Jenny Nelson. I feel like both of those, um, both of you just have such beautiful style and storytelling. Um, and that, I think that reading those books was what made me feel like, oh, I wanna be a young adult writer, um, really inspired me. So yeah, it's really- That means so much to me, thank you. <laughs> Did you know that Jandy's my upstairs neighbor? No. We own, we own a duplex together. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'll tell her when we're finished that you said kind of things about her. Please do, yeah. That is the nicest possible way to end, to think about this writerly community inspiring each other and living as neighbors. That's amazing. <laughs> um, Kate and Nina, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. This has been really special. It's such a pleasure to get to, to share this space with you. Thank you for hosting us. And Kate, thank you again for inviting me to be part of your debut. It's such an honor. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for hosting and your very thoughtful questions, Nina. And thank you, audience, so much for joining us tonight. It's really lovely to have you all here with us. If you haven't done so already, you can order uh, Kate's books and Nina's books at northshire.com and check out other great events that we have coming up. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.